Hello, everyone. Um, my name is John Hare-Winton. I'm a senior QA automation engineer uh, at The Guardian, based in London. Um, for those of you that don't know The Guardian, we're the second largest English language news company in the world. Um, and we develop all our own products in-house. That's everything from our website to our mobile apps to our editorial tools that all our journalists use to create our content. That's all built in-house by a team of about 160 people. Um, and for me personally, I've, I've worked there for about five years. Um, I started off as a manual tester before moving into automation and then kind of more general development after that. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about testing in production and whether it is dangerous, scary, or potentially better. Um, so to do that, we're going to briefly talk testing in production. What, what actually is it? Um, then probably more importantly, why we'd want to do it in the first place. Then go into some detail on the challenges involved with it. And then I'll use an example of some work that I've been doing over the last sort of six to nine months with this, um, just to show you how you can kind of take this idea a little bit further. And then we'll wrap up at the end with um, some lessons learned. So yeah, the first point, uh, what is testing in production? Well, it, it's exactly what it says it is. It is using your production environment for testing purposes, which sounds quite straightforward, but then kind of the bigger question is, is why would you want to do it? I mean, we, ha we have test environments. That's where we test. That's where we've always tested. Um, so really, to go into some detail on this, really, this is kind of your traditional development flow, and whether your team's working in kind of an agile way or um, what, you know, you're using a traditional waterfall method, essentially, it's going to come down to some variance on this, where we develop, then we test, then we deploy, and then you probably do some quick deployment checks once you've released. Um, but as we're talking about testing in production, let's talk about what environments we actually use for these stages. So development, that's going to happen on a local environment. That you know, It might even be a cloud-based thing these days, but it's a separate environment. It's isolated. It's on its own. Testing, very similarly, is going to happen on a test or staging environment, which again is separate and it's isolated. Whereas then deployment and then our quick kind of post-release check, that happens on production. But kind of the problem as I see it with this is production, that's where our users operate. That's where you know, we make our money, that's where we, you know, we grow our business, all that kind of stuff. That happens in production, whereas all the kind of development and product work happens on these kind of two isolated environments that are, are not where our users live. And is that a problem? Potentially, we'll talk about that in a second. But that's kind of one problem that I see with this flow, this kind of distance from production where our users live. Because as testers, we're meant to, you know, we're, we look out for the users. We, we you know, keep, we um, present their best interests to our development team. And we're kind of operating a long way away from where they actually, where they use our products. And then the second problem with this for me is that once we've released and we've done that kind of quick production check, there's a gap. Um, we don't really know what's going on in production, which again, it's where our users live. That's a problem. I definitely think that's a problem. So we've got two problems here, distance from where our users are, and then even an awareness of, of what's going on, because we're kind of abandoning them once, um, once we've released to production. And I reckon we can solve this by testing in prod, testing in production. Um, and I'm going to try and convince you that that is something that we can do. So thinking of that flow and those two problems we've got, the first one being the distance from where our users are, and the second one being that kind of post-release gap. Well, we test in test environments, though. You know, that's what we've always done. We've always used test environments um, when, you know, for testing our products. That's what we do as an industry. Um, and there are some def definite benefits to that. I mean, test environments, they allow us to make a mess, essentially. Um, if you think of every, probably every test environment you've ever been on, there'll be some absolutely crazy test data in there that doesn't make much sense. Um, and even better, we don't have to clear up that mess. We can just leave our test environments in very, very strange states. Um, and even with the best will in the world, when you're running a, you know, using a test environment for automated tests, you, you try and clean up after yourself, but there's still, there's always a lot of very strange stuff on there. But that's okay, because it's a test environment. It's, it's isolated. Our users are never going to see it. 
Test environments allow us to test before we release to our production environments. That sounds pretty safe. That sounds pretty responsible to me. Um, and test environments allow us to have total control over the environment where we're running our automated tests. So we know how much traffic's going to be running on that environment. We know what stubbed versions of all our APIs we're using, all that kind of stuff. We've got total control, so we know exactly what's going on with that environment. So that's kind of the good sides of test environments. But what about the downsides? Um, first off, they're really maintenance heavy. Um, you probably have an ops team whose pretty much sole responsibility is to maintain your production environment. Or if you're working in more of a DevOps world, then your team is maintaining your production environment. And that's a big job. It's a lot of effort. And the test environment is another environment that's trying to replicate production. So it's an awful lot of effort to keep a test environment in a good state. And what makes that even harder is it's always going to be a lower priority than your production environment. You know, particularly for your ops team, because production's where the users are. That's where we make the money. It's always going to be lower priority. And that, that's correct. The test environment should be a lower priority than production. And then also, I said that test environments, an advantage of them is having total control. But that can also lead to downsides, because they can become too isolated. So for instance, say you've got a stubbed version of an API um, on your test environment. And then the team that, that develops that API, they make you know, a, a big fundamental change to it. You've got to update your stubs, which, me, which could either mean it's a lot of maintenance, the first point, or it doesn't happen at all. So then your environment becomes inaccurate. And this is where we can get the real problems of that kind of distance from production, because we're testing our products on an environment that might not necessarily represent our production environment. So that's a problem. but. We've, we've been used to dealing with all these problems for years, um, but testing in production brings other problems, which we'll talk about in a minute. So back to that flow. So we've just talked about kind of the issue of kind of the distance from production. But what about this issue at the end, this kind of question mark of once we've released to production, how do we know what's going on? Well, we have monitoring. Um, and you know, this is quite often a um, function of your ops team, or if you're DevOps, you do it in team. But we have monitoring on all, on all of our services. And, you know, that's really good practice. Everybody does it. Um, but monitoring has some limitations. So monitoring is great for all of these things on the left. So you know, telling you about your API responses or HTTP errors, anything you know to do with machine status or traffic levels or crash reporting, all these very specific metrics about our systems. And that's really, really good. That's incredibly useful, and it tells us a lot about what's happening on production. But it's this integrated user journey part. Monitoring can't give us that. Monitoring can give us individual statistics about our systems, but it can't tell us what experience the user is getting on our production systems. And that, I see, is a bit of a gap. That's a bit of, a, of an oversight in our monitoring. And that becomes more of a problem because of this going faster. So all the kind of trends in software development at the moment, whether you want to call it shifting left or DevOps or anything like that, it's all about moving faster. It's all about releasing much more often. And that can cause us problems if we've got gaps in our monitoring, because you're know, kind of back in the old days where we were releasing you know, once every few months, or once we kind of went to Agile, we're releasing once every two weeks or so. Once you've released, production, your own production environment is in a very similar state. You know, traffic will go up and down and everything like that, but what you're actually running is staying the same for quite long periods of time. Whereas if you're using kind of a continuous delivery, um, delivery model or anything like that, you're moving much, much faster. So your production environment is in a constant state of change. So that puts a bigger emphasis on monitoring. And if monitoring isn't picking up kind of the holistic user journey for us, that creates a problem. That can be a gap for us that we need to have a look at. <clears throat> so I'm suggesting that these two problems of a kind of lack of visibility in monitoring and um, the distance of our test environments, our production environments, we can solve these by testing in production. But production's kind of scary, isn't it? You know, it's, the production environment is incredibly important, and I'm suggesting we're going to start running tests there. Like, is this completely mad? Um, and this is normally the bit where people are kind of yeah, like, yeah, you, you, why, why on earth would you test on prod? You're absolutely mad. But 
And that's why the talk is called, you know, testing in production, dangerous or scary. Um, but really, when you really think about it, all our fears about testing in production comes down to essentially one thing. There is one fear with this, and that's what if users notice. So if there's any evidence of our tests, that could be all, you know, all of these things. They could see a test while it's running, test data, test residue, kind of you know, leftover evidence of tests. That's a problem, because we don't want users to see that in production. But that's actually the only fear with testing in production. Because that slide earlier where I said all the downsides of test environments, you know, kind of being maintenance heavy and isolated, well, you don't get those problems with production at all because it's not isolated, it's the production environment. Um, it's not going to be unrepresentative because because it is. It is our actual production environment. So all those challenges kind of go away and you're replaced with this one challenge when you're testing in production. You've got to keep your tests hidden and any evidence, any visibility of them, you, we don't want our users to see it. So what testing in production boils down to is, is removing all those kind of old test environment challenges and replacing it with this one challenge, which is kind of easier said than done, really, because with all the issues of test environments, we're used to dealing with those. You know, we've dealt with those as an industry for decades, um, and there's loads of best practice that you can do to solve all those problems, and all those best practices can be applied kind of across the board to whatever products you're working on, whatever industry you're working in. But with testing in production, if you're trying to keep test data hidden, there's not like a single best practice for that. It's 100% specific to the product that you're building. Um, and so what this normally means is you actually have to do some product work to make your, your application or your website or whatever be able to hide data, um, which sounds like a bit of a big ask at first. But if you think we do this all the time with our products, we, we do things to them to make them more testable. So that might be things like you know, just making sure a web page has good identifiers for web driver tests or something like that. It's, it's this upfront effort to make our products more testable. And hopefully, over the next few slides, I will convince you that this is work that is actually worth doing because you can get some big benefits out of testing in production. So that's kind of the, that's, this is the what and the why of, uh, of testing in prod, why we'd want to do it. But what does it actually look like when we start doing it in practice? So at The Guardian, we've been experimenting with testing in production on and off for about two years or so. Um, and it started with just a few experiments that a couple of our developers and our testers did around you know, regularly pinging our production systems with a, with a couple of tests just to see if that would, if that would help us out. And it's kind of evolved over, over the last two years to something where we were just kind of dabbling at first. And then over the last 18 months or a year or so, it's become one of our big, big focuses of our, of our um, test team at The Guardian. And we found it kind of goes down two potential paths when you decide you want to try doing some testing in production. And the first of those is using production tests in a pipeline, so in a traditional continuous integration pipeline, and making just a slight shift with that. So normally your, um, your CI pipeline, it would be develop, test, release. Whereas with this, you develop, you release, and then you test, um, which that sounds scary at first, but that whole thing about keeping it hidden, in this context, that can actually mean keeping your release hidden. So um, a lot of people that do this um, will use feature flags and things like that, so they'll release something to their production environment, but it's completely hidden from users. Then they run their tests. If the tests pass, um, the feature flag is turned off, and you can, all, all the users can then see it. So that, that's actually how far it can go with this. And this, this can be really, really useful. Um, in a few different kind of circumstances. So quite often, um, what, well, one of our teams at The Guardian uses this. Um, they build a product that, has, that integrates with a lot of third-party payment systems um, that don't provide test environments. Um, so for them to try and stub out a full payment system was an you know, absolutely enormous amount of effort. Whereas if they could keep the test data hidden, they could test in production, it, it meant they're actually able to run tests. Whereas before, their test, their test environment wasn't going to be representative at all. Um, and another example when this can be really, really useful. So if you're a very small company, um, environments are incredibly expensive. 
uh, maybe your company can't afford a test environment, this can actually work really, really well for that. Um, or you, know, you might not have the expertise or enough people to maintain two environments. This can solve that problem. But, so this kind of solves the, that, that one from the chart earlier of showing the distance of test environments from our production users, but what about that other one with monitoring, that, where I said you know, monitoring doesn't give us visibility of the holistic user journey. So we started using tests in production as an addition to our kind of traditional kind of metric-based monitoring. And this is what I've been working on for the last sort of six months or so. So I'm going to use an example um, of a product that I built that uses this um, and kind of show you the sort of the journey we went on to, to evolve this kind of idea of testing in production, but as a monitoring service. So this is an article on the Guardian website, um, which is actually an article about this exact subject. But you know, it's, I'm not just doing this for page views. Um, <clears throat> So I work on the editorial tools team at The Guardian. So we build a series of very small tools that kind of combine together to make one big suite of tools for our journalists to create all of our news content and publish it to the website and our mobile apps. Um, and these products, they've always had really meticulous monitoring on them. Um, but quite often, we were still missing issues in production. Um, so kind of a conversation with our users would quite often say something like, there's a problem on the, there's a problem with the tools, and that would be the first we knew about it. Because um, our, our monitoring, it was picking up individual issues, so you know, we'd start to see fluctuations in, in you know, API responses and all that kind of thing, but we weren't seeing these issues from the user's perspective. So we wanted to try and fix that. We wanted to try and plug that gap in our visibility of production. So we decided to start running some tests in production as a monitoring service. So the first thing we wanted to be able to do, because this is production, we, didn't wanna, we weren't looking to run like a traditional CI pipeline style of tests. We were going to look at the exact things that our users were going to be doing in production and the most important user journeys for us and make sure that those worked in production on a regular basis. So the first thing we were going to do, we were going to create a piece of content, nice and simple, and then we were going to follow it through our entire stack. So all the way from clicking publish in the editorial tools, all the way through to our mobile apps and our website to make sure the users could actually see content that was being published and that everything worked. Um, and that, as a news company, you'd think is probably our most important thing. If a major news event happens, we have to be able to publish a story about it. Um, but then we realized there was actually another user journey that was equally important for us. So when it comes to publishing content, we publish probably around 400 pieces of content per day. Um, so if something goes wrong with publishing, we're going to know quite quickly because people are using the system all the time and they're going to they're pick up on if there's a problem there. But we also have this thing called takedown. So a takedown is when we take a piece of content off the website. Um, and this could be because it's inaccurate or it's legally sensitive, perhaps. Um, meaning if, if the content stays up, we could potentially get sued. So whereas if we can't publish, that's embarrassing. If we can't take a piece of content down, that's you know, quite damaging to the business, potentially. So we realized that was kind of our, our priority case as well. And then we were going to follow that through the stack, obviously. Um, so kind of what this was aiming to achieve was to make sure that um, we could do both of these things all the time because another problem of relying on users to report issues to you is fluctuations of use. Um, so we're based in London. We publish 400 pieces of content a day. Most of that happens within UK business hours. Whereas we also have an office in Sydney and an office in New York, and they're much, much smaller. So they're not publishing anywhere near as regularly. So whereas if there's a problem with publishing in the UK, we're going to know very, very quickly. Whereas if a problem develops on production, you know, uh, and the problem starts at 2 in the afternoon in the US, our development teams in London, they're not going to have any idea about that until someone tries to publish a piece of content um, when it, you know, there's a massive news event or something like that, and they can't, but the problem's been there for a few hours. So we're hoping to, to plug that gap with these, with these tests. So that was the idea. And then when it came to actually implementing this, my, th my first thought as kind of a test automator was write some tests, 
put it in Jenkins or a CI service and have it on a cron job and run it on a schedule every now and then just to have a good idea of what's going on in production. But then, and this was kind of the, the, kind of the big jump of this, of when it's really switched from traditional testing to testing as monitoring, was we decided that wasn't going to work. That wasn't quick enough. We were going to test all the time, like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There was always going to be one of these tests running at any given point. So this is when it starts to blur that line with, with traditional monitoring in that you're constantly getting feedback from this. And so, that, so doing this, writing these tests, building this out, and then having it running continually, that was going to be, was going to be quite a few challenges in there. First of those being, it's testing in production. We've got to make sure we can hide test content. So that's the first challenge. Uh, second one was going to be the tests themselves, because um, they were going to be running a lot. So they were going to have to be very, very robust. Then continual running. How were we actually going to keep tests in a constant state of running? And what was that going to mean for the machines they were running on and all that kind of thing? And then the visibility of test results. Because when you're using tests as monitoring, what you, the kind of visibility you want from them is very different from what you want when you're running tests in kind of a traditional continuous integration pipeline. So I'm going to go through all these challenges. And hopefully, this kind of worked quite well as an example of what kind of happens when you try to do this. So first up, that big challenge of hiding test content. How do we do that? So, and this is kind of, as I said earlier, this is the thing of testing in production that is 100% specific to whatever you're testing. Um, there's no kind of golden rules for, for how you do this. So for us, with our tests, like I said about a second ago, we were going to create a piece of content and publish it the whole way through our stack. And we needed to make, so we needed to make sure users couldn't see that at all. So what we did is we sat down with um, developers from all our different teams that develop our APIs and our website and our mobile apps. Um, we wanted to find a way where we could publish a piece of content and keep it as hidden as possible um, with the least amount of effort. So we didn't want to have to completely refactor how our website worked or how our APIs worked. We just wanted to do this quickly and simply and in the easiest way possible. And we actually found a solution very, very quickly. So the way our main API works is that content comes from our editorial tools. Um, we publish it, and it goes to a main API. And that API has two kind of major endpoints. There's the item endpoint, which is the actual piece of content itself. And so if you have the exact address for that piece of content, you can hit the item endpoint, and you will find it there. Whereas then the other major endpoint is the search endpoint. And that's how you actually find content. And so all our tools, so our, our, our website, um, all our tools for deciding what appears on our front pages, all that kind of thing, that all uses the search endpoint. So that meant if we could hide the content from the search endpoint, no one would ever find it. Um, and that, that was good enough. It meant we could publish a piece of content through our stack. Our tests would be able to pick it up because they'd know exactly where to look for it. But no one else would be able to find it because it was hidden on the search endpoint. And the way we did that was really, really simple. Um, we, we tag all our news content. I mean, you've probably seen this on, on most uh, websites or blogging sites. You tag your content with you know, related subjects. So for instance, if we were publishing a piece of content about a World Cup soccer match, it would probably be tagged as sport, soccer, um, the two countries playing, and World Cup, or something like that. So we created a new tag called Production Monitoring, which is what we called this service. Um, and then our API just put a rule in that if a piece of content had that tag, it wouldn't appear on the search endpoint. So that was actually incredibly easy for us to keep it hidden. But then as we started running these tests, we started finding weird little edge cases of where our test data in production was starting to produce problems. So first off um, was page view tracking. So we track every page view on our website, as most websites do. And because we were following these pieces of test content the whole way through the stack, it meant we were generating page views, because WebDriver was going to the, the front page and actually checking these articles. And once we'd started being able to run continually, we were starting to be able to run these tests a few thousand times a day. So it was generating a few thousand page views, which is not insignificant. Um, so we had to make sure that we were hiding, we were filtering out 
um, test content from our page view tracking as well, which was something that we hadn't really anticipated having to do. Um, and another thing that came up with this quite strangely was that, I mean, that we um, all of our news content goes onto the newswire, so it's kind of syndicated content, and other news providers can pick it up. Uh, we had to. We realized quite quickly that we had to make sure none of our test content appeared in those feeds either. So we had to filter it out there as well. Um, and also for, for our legal team. So I mentioned earlier about taking down content is kind of a legally sensitive thing. So whenever a piece of content is taken down, it generates a report to our legal team, and they check over that that's okay. And that was fine when they were getting one or two of these a day. Once we were starting running a few thousand tests a day, our legal team came over to us looking very, very concerned because they were getting a few thousand pieces of content on there. We didn't even know that report even existed. So we had to filter that one out as well. So it's just kind of like to, uh, there was the easy bit of um, kind of how to keep the content hidden from the digital products, but then there was all these other things that we had to, had to look at that we didn't necessarily know that we were going to have to do. But that was hiding the test content, and that actually proved to be quite simple, quite straightforward, um, which I thought this would be the hard part, but it really, really wasn't. Because the hard part kind of came in actually getting these things to work really, really well. Um, so the whole idea behind these tests was that we were going to be doing it from the user's perspective. So that meant all, you know, all our tools are based in the browser, so that meant there were going to be web driver tests. And that's probably why I'm speaking at a Selenium conference. Because um, when it comes to you know, recreating user interactions in a browser, this is the best. You know, Selenium WebDriver it is easily the best thing for doing that. Um, but it meant if we were going to be running these tests a lot of times, they needed to be very, very robust. Um, because they were going to be running a few thousand times a day. Um, so we needed to, you know, make sure we were just doing WebDriver really, really well. You know, all the all the best practices, um, you know, making every step conditional on the previous step, um, and things like oh, I've completely lost my thread now. Um, making sure that we were using, you know, we weren't doing all our assertions on the UI. We were just triggering user actions and making sure that. Um, you know, that action triggered what we expected in the database or in the API, kind of doing WebDriver properly. Um, so that was cool. That was fine. You know, we're test automators. That's what we do. But then when it came to actually trying to get tests to run continually, that's a whole different kind of thing because pretty much all the test frameworks that we could find out there, they're all kind of aimed towards continuous integration pipelines and things like that, and running tests in kind of one-off instances. Um, so it's how do you actually get tests to run continually? Um, and we were quite lucky with how straightforward this part was for us, because we use Scala as a programming language at The Guardian. Um, it's a functional programming language that's built on the um, Java JVM. Um, and Scala has a great test framework called Scala Test. Um, and what Scala Test does is it gives you a series of different test runners for running tests under slightly different conditions. And they didn't have a continual test runner, but we were able to build one out quite easily because you can just sort of, <coughs> excuse me, um, kind of fork what they've got there already. And this is the uh, gratuitous code sample. Don't worry about what it actually means. Um, I was told before I did this, it's like, you've got to get some code in there. I was like, OK. Um, so building a test runner that could continually run tests over and over, so as soon as one finishes, the next one starts, that was really, really easy. We, we got to that point very, very quickly. That was probably only about a day's worth of work to be able to do that. But then we started getting the implications of running tests like that. Um, so what do I mean by these, these implications? Well. First off, like I said earlier, we'd used kind of all the web driver best practices. So we were kind of, you know, whenever you um, start up some tests, you spin up a new instance of web driver, you run your tests, and then you kill that instance. And then you spin up another one and continue. And that's fine when you're running tests in your CI pipeline maybe 10, 15, 20, 100 times a day because they're staggered. Whereas it became apparent quite quickly that the because of the length of the tests we're running, if we're running them continually, we could run them a few thousand times a day. And so if you're doing a very short test run and then you kill 
your web driver instance and spin up another one, kind of the threads and the processes that that spins up, they don't go away instantly when you kill the driver. And that, that's fine most of the time, but when you're running continually, you start getting a lot of threads hanging around that haven't quite gone away yet. And so we found we were maxing out the boxes that we were running on quite quickly, and they were slowing down or even falling over. And that kind of became yeah, a, bit of, a bit of a theme with this, of uh, thing, kind of the implications of running tests continually. So we had to throw out that bit of WebDriver best practice. We, we couldn't keep killing our instances of WebDriver and spinning up new ones because it was just going to take our boxes down. So we decided, OK, when the service starts, we'll spin up an instance of WebDriver and just leave it running um, and just keep passing new tests to it. And we thought, in theory, that should be fine. Uh, we had a look online, we couldn't find any examples of people doing this, really. So we didn't know if a single like Java instance of, of WebDriver would be able to stay running for that long. But actually, it's been absolutely fine. We've had this running for months, and that one WebDriver instance has never fallen over. So this is why we love WebDriver. Um, but then, also in terms of kind of once we got to the point where the boxes could keep tests running continually, um, it became apparent that the tests were going to have to be way more robust than anything I'd ever written before. Um, because writing web driver tests and API tests that are going to run in a continuous integration um, scenario, and they're going to run maybe, like I said, 10, 15, 20, 100 times a day, small bits of inaccuracy in the tests then are actually kind of OK. Um, it's not ideal, but it's OK. And by test inaccuracy, I mean if the tests go red and they fail, it's a problem of the system they're testing, not a problem with the tests themselves. And also, when they go green, it means the product is fine, not the tests are reporting incorrectly. Um, so when you're running in a CI pipeline and you're running tests a few times a day, those little bits of inaccuracy where tests come up red, you go onto the, you know, your CI box and say, oh, it's a problem with the tests, and you go and fix it. That's, so, that's kind of, it's annoying, and it's not ideal, but it's kind of acceptable, especially proportional to the effort that it'll take to, to fix these. Because small inaccuracy, it's not, it's not the worst thing in the world. But when you're running tests several thousand times a day, even if you've got, you know, a 5% inaccuracy rate, which you'd, you'd barely notice when you're running 20 times a day. If you're running, well, actually, the actual numbers on this, we were running tests, three, we were running 3,200 tests per day, you know, you, going through the whole UI and everything like that. If we had 5% inaccuracy there, that's still 160 failures per day, which is, it's not good enough. So we had to really, really push how robust we could get these tests. So I said about, you know, kind of doing good web drivers and making, making everything, every single test step conditional. So when you're testing on a test environment, you kind of know what your test environment is going to be like. You know the steps you can go through really, really quickly because they're always going to work like that. Um, and then you kind of have your conditional weights when you get to something that's going to take a while to render or whatever. We, we couldn't do that because we're testing in production. Production fluctuates too much. Response times go up and down, all that kind of thing. So we had to make everything completely conditional on the previous step, um, like 100%. And that was good. We did quite well with that. Um, we got to a level of about 95% accuracy quite quickly. Um, actually, there's an accuracy slide. Um, but when, like I said, when you're running 3,200 times a day, 5% inaccuracy is a lot of failed tests. Whereas if we did a bit more work, try and get some more reliability out of the tests, it was going to be much, more, much better for us. So we put in a lot of effort, and we started going into things like, um, so we've made every step conditional. We started looking at particular response times, what was, it, what was acceptable to our users in terms of API responses, and working out exactly how far we could push this stuff. And so with a lot, lot more effort doing WebDriver even better, all that kind of stuff, we got to a point of about 97% accuracy. That uh, still wasn't enough, not even close. Um, so then we really, really started pushing re test reliability. So that meant going into things like thread level on the machines. And this was kind of going way beyond stuff I'd done before. So we got 
a few of our developers and infrastructure guys quite involved with this. Um, you know, we were finding stuff like uh, we were using a Scala library to generate cookies so that we could auth against all our systems. Um, and we found that when we were killing that, like the processes weren't going away quick enough, a bit similar to WebDriver. So we had to refactor that library so that it could actually work well enough for this and not start taking out our boxes. Um, and that meant we got to a point of about 99.5 to 99.7% accuracy with these tests, which is good. Um, but the effort to get there was absolutely huge. So to get kind of that, for every like extra point one of a percent you're trying to get, it gets harder and harder and harder. Um, and so we realized, like, proportional to the effort, and just because of the fluctuations of production, getting to 100% test reliability was going to be near on impossible. Um, so we needed a tolerance level in our reporting. So we built this kind of concept within the tests of they, they have an awareness of the last 10 test runs. So if a test fails, so if one test fails, we don't actually alert. We just kind of flag a warning there might be a problem. Then if we get another failure within that, those 10 runs, then we alert. And this is kind of OK for us because we're running tests so quickly. Allowing one failure doesn't actually delay our reporting that much because we're going to find out in about 30 seconds if it really is a problem. Um, and this kind of deals with that, gives us a bit of tolerance of those test inaccuracies. Um, and also, it's, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. And using a system of a tolerance level, it's a bit more reliable than just retrying tests. So there was, a, there was a kind of trend in test frameworks a few years ago of if a test, you could you know, say a test was able to retry itself. So if it failed, you just instantly retry it. If it passed, then you'd say it was, it was good, it was green. But the problem with doing that is it doesn't pick up intermittent issues. So an issue that's going to only affect your users four out of every 10 times they run it. If you're using, using test retries, you're going to miss those problems. Whereas with a tolerance level of this kind of idea of allowing two failures in 10, we weren't going to miss that. Um, the last challenge of, of doing this, of test, test as monitoring, was visibility of results. Uh, because what, the way you want tests to report when you're using them in a continuous integration pipeline is very different from when you're using them as monitoring. So, when you're using tests in a CI pipeline, every single test run triggers an action. So if the tests go green, it means you know, merge your code or push out a release. And then if they go red, it's investigate, fix the product, or fix the tests. Whereas when you're using tests as monitoring, green tests, so tests that pass, they don't trigger an action at all. It's, everything's fine. It's all good. You don't need to pay attention to them. It's only when it goes red and tests fail that you're, you, know, you really need to worry about it because something's failing in production. So that meant we really had to just borrow how we report monitoring issues. So, <clears throat> excuse me. With, um, with the um, custom test runner that we built, we rooted our reporting and we just report into a database. And we have a web front end that looks like this that gives us list of lists of all our tests. And if they're green, it's fine. Nothing happens. You can go onto this page and kind of use it as a dashboard to see that everything's fine. Um, but it's only when stuff goes red that we actually take any action. Um, with this front end, it's quite nice. You can kind of drill into each test and um, view all the steps that you've, you've performed in a test, all that kind of thing. Um, it's only when something goes red and we start getting a failure that we alert um, immediately to Slack because our team works, we're always in Slack. Um, and we also use a um, incident tracking and resolution um, product called PagerDuty. So we alert to that. Um, so that means it, these report in exactly the same way as all our other monitoring. Um, so it's exactly the same as if our APIs start chucking out loads of 500 errors. We see it in exactly the same way. Um, whereas the green tests, you, you know, you can drill into the web framework and have a look at them, but you're not going to see, we're not reporting on those because, you know, who wants 3,200 test reports to go through in a day? No one's going to do that. Um, so kind of what, what this has done for us, it's, it's been incredibly useful. So this is the actual product itself. Um, we have it running 3,200 tests a day, um, very reliable, robust tests. Um, 
And that conversation that I mentioned earlier with our users, so our, our editorial staff, quite often they would be coming to us and saying there was a problem. Whereas now, they come to us and say there's a problem, and we say, we already know, and we're fixing it, or we've, we've just rolled out a fix for it. It kind of removes that, that gap in our monitoring of having you know, no visibility of the whole user journey. This is doing this, and it's doing it all the time. And the other advantage of this is also in how we can list all our test steps. Whereas when you're running tests like web driver tests in a continual pipeline, if there's a problem with them, someone needs to understand how the tests work and all that kind of thing. Whereas because this reports like this, anyone can go in and drill into it um, and see if we've got a problem in production, they can see where stuff's falling over. They don't need to worry about how those tests are working because we just, we just make it look like a user using it. Um, and it's been massively beneficial for us. So that's kind of the, the end of my long rambling example, um, which kind of brings us to, uh, I've already said those things. Um, so that brings us to kind of our conclusion and lessons learned about testing in production. And so the talk was called Testing in Production, Dangerous, Scary, or Better. Well, it's not scary and it's not dangerous. It's just different. So all those issues I said about with test environments, you know, about maintaining them and them becoming inaccurate and isolated, we're used to dealing with those problems. Um, and as testers, we've got very good at dealing with those problems. What happens when you test in production is all those test environment problems, they go away. We don't have to worry about maintenance and all that kind of thing. But we do replace that, all those challenges with that one big challenge of keeping our test data hidden. But that's it. Um, it's nice and simple, supposedly. Um, but then is it better? Um, and this is the point where you're probably expecting, because it's a conference, I'm going to talk in absolutes and say, yes, you know, ditch all your testing in test environments and test everything in production. But I'm not going to say that, um, because it's not a replacement for traditional testing, it's an addition. Um, I mean, in some cases, like I said, if, if maintaining a test environment, you're not able to do that, or you're not able to make an accurate test environment, testing in prod could be useful. Um, but then also, if, you, if you're having issues with that kind of gap in monitoring, you're not monitoring your full user journey, this can really, really plug that gap, and it's really, really useful. Um, so the team, where, from my example, where we're continually testing um, our products in production, we still do do some pre-release tests on those products as well. Um, so it's not an absolute thing. I'm not saying you should dis um, like ditch your test environments. But this is definitely something worth looking at, and I think most products could benefit from some production testing. So it's kind of the last slide. Oh, no. There should be one more slide, uh, but I don't know where it's gone. Um, and the last slide was, if you want to give this a try, like what, what sort of things do you need to do um, to do this? Well, first off is... Um, you need to look at what your product and business flows are and what the most critical ones are. Because like I said, particularly when using tests as monitoring in production, they've got to be incredibly robust, and that takes a lot of effort to build. So you don't want to build a whole suite of production tests. You want to test your absolute priority number one use cases. Um, and then the, the, the second thing is working out how to keep test data hidden, hidden in production. Like I said, that's 100% specific to your products. Um, only people within your business can work out how to do that, but it is effort that's worth going into. And then the last thing is deciding if the best thing for your team is to use production tests in a traditional pipeline or production tests as monitoring. And there's arguments for both, and it's completely down to you know, what the use case is for your, uh, your business and what, that, what your team needs. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that's been useful. <clears throat> Do you have time for any questions? Hi, thank you Hi. for your talk. Um, I have a question. Like, do you do you have some kind of cleanup uh, on prod? You know, uh, you generate a lot of content, yeah. and database gets bigger and bigger within time. So, do you do you clean them somehow? Yes, yes, we do. So, in kind of two ways. So, we kind of in quite a traditional test way, we delete the test data once we've used it. Um, but this was another area where we found testing in production was slightly different because if a test failed, we didn't want to delete that piece of content immediately. We wanted it to stay there so we could go and investigate. Um, so as well as just having a, we just 
do an API call after a successful test run to, to our API to delete the piece of content. We also, any content, any test that fail, that piece of content goes into a database and we just store it for, I think it's 48 hours now. Um, that allow, means it's there for us to investigate and then we have a cleanup job that just goes through all those things that are over 48 hours old and we just, again, ping an API call to delete them um, because we, we assume they're past the point where we want to investigate them. So Got it, thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Um, hi, thanks hi. for the talk, very, very impressive. Um, my question is, uh, did you face any legal uh, requirements, problems, uh, with this production test, like you, you, you have to keep data uh, all the time in production and uh, you, you hit, it, hit it and somehow, yeah. Um, so in terms of legal requirements, this is where we're quite lucky um, because we are a, a news publisher. So we're publishing news content. Um, so it's not legally sensitive or anything like that. Um, so there weren't really any legal problems. When we've tried doing this with payment systems and stuff like that, there can be because you're generating actual payments, so you have to look into kind of expiry times of payments, all that kind of thing. Um, one thing we did have to be very cautious of was being aware that if something did go wrong with the tests, um, the test data that we were producing, it had to be, um, it had to be clean. So it couldn't be like a fake news article because fake news. Um, but so what that meant was just in case anything did go wrong and someone was able, some of our test data on production did get in front of a user, it very clearly states what it is. So that article says, I am test content and explains why it exists. Um, so yeah, it wasn't kind of a legal concern so much for us. It was more just a, what if something goes wrong? What, if a user does see it, what, what does it look like? Thank you. Cool. Anyone else? Well, there's one right at the back, actually. Okay. Hey. Well, first of all, thanks for being brave to run tests at the prod and sharing the experience with us. Thank you. Uh, and my question would be, did you get the actual benefit of finding like major issues at production and not discovering those at the test environments before that? Yeah, um, so because our test environment, you know, test environments, like I said, they can be, they're kind of fulfilling a different purpose. They're very good for kind of functional testing and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when it comes to just how your products are going to behave in production, so production fluctuates wildly. Um, and, you know, some issues don't manifest themselves until they've been running, you know, you've, until you've had your product deployed and have been running it for a few days, a few weeks. They might only occur under really unusual circumstances that we weren't going to pick up anyway. Um, so that's what this has allowed us to do. It's kind of filled that gap in bugs that take a while to manifest. Um, and also, I mean, from how our team works, we deploy, we move very, very quickly. We deploy a few times per day, usually. Um, and so it, when it's, it's not possible for us to run, you know, a few hours worth of tests per, per release. So this kind of covers us um, to move a little bit quicker as well. But again, like I said, we're a news company, so we're slightly lower risk than, um, you know, say a banking system or something like that. Any other questions? Thanks. There's a guy right at the back who's waving very enthusiastically if we can get a microphone to him. Um, are there any microphones going around? Yeah, there's some, a guy right at the back who's very enthusiastic. <laughs> so, what's the problem of sitting at the back, Thanks. isn't it? Hi. Hi. Uh, so, here you have faced the situation where uh, you, uh, your customers saw all the test data you have on the production. Uh, that has never happened. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> luckily. But, like I said, in case it ever did happen, the piece of content that we produce, it's very explicit about what it is. It says, I am test data, and then explains why we run production tests. So it's kind of, we almost have, we just, the article we produce is essentially a blog post saying why we test in production. So that if a user ever was to stumble across it, you know, it's not going to be like a, a news story saying something ridiculous that hasn't actually happened. So it's, we, you have to be quite careful with the test data. Cool. I think that's all we have Hi. time for, unfortunately. Yeah, so um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to come and um, grab me after this. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it.